All of this is kind of leading us to thinking about then precipitation on our planet. And Harmon Craig, what a great guy he was, what a smart guy he was. He said, wait a minute, we should be able to go out and have some basic predictive frameworks for what the precipitation on our planet should behave like in what, we, what he calls the meteoric water system. And so what Harmon Craig did in a really interesting set of papers, the first one came out in 1958, and the seminal paper came out in 1961, he, he said, let's look at all the meteoric water on our planet and come up with some isotope predictions about what we might expect its hydrogen and its oxygen isotope composition to look like. So what he did is he went to all of these different meteorological stations. These are real data. all right. They are the weighted average of all the precip that fell at a particular site on the planet where they were collecting precip. And he took the weighted average of that, and he got its oxygen and its hydrogen isotope composition, and he plotted it. All right? So there's 400 data points actually in this initial uh, data set that Harmon Craig published. And then he said, let's just put a simple regression through it and see what it says. And this is what he came up with. He said, ah, we have a predictive framework here that the hydrogen isotope composition is going to be equal to 8 plus whatever the oxygen is plus 10. And so when he, when he put this up here and he, and he published his paper, he said, 8. There's that number 8. Cool. What this says is that then probably most of the precipitation on the planet because it's falling on a line with a slope of 8, it's pretty much an equilibrium process that creates our precip variation on the planet. Precip comes off, or vapor comes off the ocean, rains back down. So, you know, he said largely we're getting all the isotopes back. And it's pretty much an equilibrium process because it's got a slope of 8. All right? But then he said, wait a minute. If we look a little harder at this, the intercept is not zero. And if everything was equilibrium, it would be zero, because every isotope that left the liquid phase would have come back. So our, our isotope expectation would have been a slope of 8 and an intercept of 0. But we get an intercept of 10, closer to 11 in this particular diagram. All right? And so what that suggests to us is that there's an additional isotope effect that's creating the intercept up here. The kinetic effect. This is suggesting that not all the water on our planet, not all the precipitation on our planet, can be explained by equilibrium isotope effects. But kinetic effects are going to come to play. In a global sense, the, the intercept of 10 will come back to and explain why it happens. But what it tells you is that you cannot understand the hydrogen and oxygen isotope variation on our planet in, in all the water sources out there that you drink and that organisms use and that spend time in glaciers and the groundwater system, and et cetera, are not explained by equilibrium. There's some kinetic effects there that we, happen to, uh, happen to, we have to pay attention to. And those kinetic effects, this is the global meteoric water line. They may manifest themselves in a lesser or a much stronger way, depending on where you are on the planet. Back to your question. If we're in a place that there was a lot of excessive evaporation, kinetic effects will become ginormous. In a very warm, tropical location, not so much. All right? So we have now some isotope expectations. A lot of equilibrium stuff that explains most of our precip but some kinetic effects, and those kinetic effects can be manifest really strongly, particularly in dry areas of the world. We live in lots of dry areas of the world, all right? How many of you live in a saturated atmosphere? All right? You come from a place where it's saturated? No. All right. So kinetic effects are going to be real, and they're going to be different for everybody in this room, depending on where you put your meteoric water line together. So we have to pay attention to them. Craig and Gordon came up with then a model for saying, we have a predictive framework for what's going to happen to the changes in the isotope composition during evaporation 
both equilibrium evaporation and also adding kinetic effects as we move water out of the ocean in a well-mixed water column and into the atmosphere. Question. So if what you're saying, um, so from what you're saying, then you should have some kind of relationship um, with ecological biomes, which are temp precipitation dependent. Bingo. And we're going to look at some maps. Exactly right. You're a step ahead of me. So when you're talking about warmer and colder regions, you're talking about like the air temperature. So then the water temperature in those regions would all regions would also have an effect, right? Because you get like in Southern California, you'll have warm temperature but cold ocean water. Where on the East Coast, you have warm temperature and warm ocean water. Potentially. So there'd be different effects there. Yeah. Too. So we're going to, and we'll look at some of those patterns. Exactly right. Exactly right. So good. You guys are getting a step ahead of me, which is awesome. All right. Okay. But before you get a step ahead of me, I'm going to, I'm going to push back and I'm going to make you look at the Craig Gordon model. And we're going to look in the next three slides, we're going to do this. We're going to look at these different layers of what Craig and Gordon were getting us to think about the complete liquid, the boundary layer, what we call the transition zone, and then the open atmosphere. And we're going to look at the characteristics of those model layers. We're going to talk about the process that leads to the isotope effect in each of those layers. And then we're going to look at the isotope numbers that we expect. All right? The isotope effects actually within the model. So the next three slides are going to walk through characteristics, processes, and isotope effects of these three layers. The characteristics, let's start from the bottom up in this slide here. All right? that's the, let's just say that's the ocean. That's our reservoir, our biggest pool out there in which water is being injected into the atmosphere. So we've got this very large body of water that we call the oceans of the world. We might be interested in smaller ones too, like your body, or a leaf, or a bug. All right, Same principles apply, but let's just start with the easier one, the ocean. All right? It's pretty well mixed. Now some of you, how many of you work in lakes? Okay, we've got one, two, three. OK, so be careful, be forewarned. If you work in lakes, you can get stratification, all right? And one of those assumptions in the Craig Gordon model gets violated. You don't have a well mixed. In the ocean, it's generally pretty well mixed. And the smaller the body of water, and if you do things like stick epidermi on there, called the leaf, it's not very well mixed. You violate some assumptions. But let's start with the, the easiest case here. If we have the ocean, we have a well mixed area, it's, it's not, and it's not stratified. But it, that can be violated. We go to the boundary layer. And again, just to remind us, that's that layer, very, very small layer, the skin on the ocean is what I like to call it, that's, that's saturated. The atmosphere right above that layer. So it's not liquid, it's vapor. But it's saturated vapor. But it's Giant, covers 70% of our planet, right? So it's a big layer, even though it's a very thin layer. And there's some different things that are going on in there in this very thin, well-mixed boundary layer. Then we have the trans transition zone, which is an area where mixing is differential, depending on where you are, if there's wind or not, if it's hot versus cold, all right? The transition area is where many of the biggest isotope effects begin to be manifest themselves because you're going now out of a saturated atmosphere into an unsaturated atmosphere. And as soon as you do that, you can expect to see kinetic isotope effects start to play, because you're not at a, in a 100% in a at, uh, saturated atmosphere any longer. Remember, if we're saturated, we can expect equilibrium effects to dominate. As soon as we're not saturated, kinetic effects begin to play some role. So this is what happens in the transition zone. And then it really happens when we get into the upper atmosphere and the well-mixed areas well up into, say, the planetary boundary layer or even into the troposphere, where we get then entrainment and mixing from other regions as well. So these are the layers and the, and the characteristics of those layers. These are some of the processes that are occurring there. And again, I've already kind of said some of this already, so we'll go through this rapidly. In our, again, in our, wa in our uh, liquid water phase, we're getting uh, rapid mixing. And of course, we can kind of think about the ocean as an infinite source of water, right? And by definition, it's SMO, right? Standard mean ocean water. So we kind of almost have an isotope expectation. 
we're kind of going to hover right around zero, right? It's, wa it's ocean water. So, oh, that's really cool, convenient for us. Because now we know that we can kind of start something in, the, in our well mixed ocean around zero. We take it into this equilibrium here. We're going to have an isotopic offset because we've got vapor created from that liquid. Depends on what the temperature is. Might be minus two for that vapor, might be minus 10, depending on how warm or how cold that atmosphere where that equilibrium exchange is taking place. Then we get into the transition zone where we can actually get mostly net diffusion out of the system because the atmosphere is a desiccator. All right? It's forcing a lot of that water to move away from the system on a one-way trip, away from where you're standing. And it may never come back for you. All right? So you just see it as a loss, a kinetic effect. It's leaving the system. All right? So the, in this area where you have an unsaturated atmosphere, you're mostly getting some net transport out. But again, it depends on where you are. If you're in Utah, that transport diffusion, it's huge, right? The relative humidity in this room right now is probably 20%. This is a desiccating environment, right? Now, if you're in the tropics, it's different. It's warmer, maybe, than it is in this room. So again, your expectations are going to be different. And then finally, we go into the open atmosphere where we get rapid mixing and, 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 and sometimes some stuff comes back that got brought in from somewhere else. All right? A lot of times in this open air transition zone is where we start to get some entrainment. We get those criminals creeping into our system here, right? And they can create some additional isotope effects, particularly in this zone here, because stuff moves around on our planet. And so you can get stuff moving in from other areas into, and boy, this is, when you start working on water, inevitably you'll start thinking you have the system nailed. And then one day you're out there measuring, and you get this isotope number, and you just go, where in the hell did this come from? And you think, OK, Darren must have collected this. <laughs> you know. But Darren's numbers are good, because he collected two of them and three of them, and they're all the same number. And you just kind of go, where did this come from? And you realize it was a different air mass. Right? It came in, and it brought something in from somewhere else. And it actually had an isotope effect in the area where you're actually making measurements. So when you start making these measurements, you've got to pay attention to what goes on in that transition open air. Okay? And then the isotope effects, as we said, here what we care about is what the original isotope value of that liquid is. Because that labels the vapor. If we're not working in the, in the ocean, our expectation isn't going to be zero. Right? What if you work on a mountain lake? where most of the water in that lake came from snow melt. Well, the water in the liquid phase is going to be labeled in a very different way. So you better measure what that liquid phase is. Don't just assume that you're starting out at zero. All right? Then in here, we know that those are all equilibrium isotope expectations, because that's a saturated atmosphere. So we expect to just see an isotopic offset explained by that equilibrium fractionation factor, alpha or that. And then when we finally get into this transition zone and up into the well-mixed atmosphere, that's where we see the kinetic effects starting to really manifest themselves. So in my face, right, I'm not in the, the boundary layer anymore. I'm in the transition zone. So I'm going to expect around me, I'm going to experience some equilibrium effects and some kinetic effects because I'm no longer in a saturated atmosphere. All right? And most of where you guys are going to be collecting samples are in that zone, that transition where you have something that's labeled from the original water. So you've got to know what that isotope composition is. You have an equilibrium effect, because you've changed phases. But you also have a kinetic effect, because you're not living in a saturated atmosphere. All right? If you can keep those things in your mind, and then, oh yeah, measure the temperature, you got it. You have everything you need in your toolbox to understand what leads to isotope variation in water. All right? And Gordon and Craig laid this out really nicely. There's mathematics that are associated with this. They're in the handout. All right? We talked about all this stuff. So let's now put this all together before we drink coffee. <laughs> 
and we're going to put it in the context of Craig's plot, the global meteoric waterline. And you can see I plotted things up here a little bit differently than what is shown in, the, in that other figure. Most of the numbers here are negative. All right, and the reason why that's the case, there's my arrow, there's SMO, right? Standard mean ocean water, zero, zero, by definition. Most of the water on our planet has a negative isotope composition, all right? And most of the reason why is because it starts out at zero, it goes through a phase change, becomes vapor. That means it becomes isotopically lighter, so it moves down into here. So I like to plot this space like this. It's a lot easier to understand meteoric waters if you work in the isotope space where you find most of the precip on the planet. Most everything you will collect will have an, a negative number, uh, unless you work in the tropics or in some goofy other places where I'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Now, let's do the animation here. So I'm going to walk you through this, and let's watch these animations, because I think at least for me, they helped me understand meteoric water and the global meteoric water line when I, when I finally put this together. And it, it, unfortunately, it took me 20 years to figure this out. You know, but I'm a slow learner. So, so our first change from snow, SMO, is here. We get an evaporation event. We create vapor. We move into that negative isotope zone for both isotopes, right? Lighter isotopes are leaving. So what the vapor phase that formed along this dashed blue line here is we're moving to collect a parcel of water out there that's isotopically lighter than the SMO that it came from. And if the whole world was an, iso was an equilibrium world, we'd basically just move back and forth along this line here. Liquid would be heavier, vapor would be lighter, and we just kind of run back and forth on that line, all right? And that line would be a slope of eight, remember? For the equilibrium isotope effects for both hydrogen and oxygen. But this is the real global meteoric water line, right? It's got a slope of eight, so it's parallel to the one I just drew up here with this dashed, but it's got a deuterium intercept, which we call the DXS, of plus 10. It's not zero, it's a positive number. Oh, so now all of a sudden we get an isotope number that's actually not negative, it's positive. How do we get there? Well, let's do an, a thought experiment. Here we are in Utah. We collect a precip sample that I labeled up here on, the, on my graph. And it has a, a high, an oxygen of that and a hydrogen of this. We, we collected it. We did it yesterday when we were out in the field. So we, we measure that, and that's our precip value. All right, so we have that's what our, that's what's going to label everything else we're going to do to that precip. Now, we take that precip, we create some vapor fr from it in an equilibrium fashion, and again we just slide down the line. Vapor's lighter than the liquid that it comes from, so you just slide down the line a little bit further. Right, pretty easy, as long as we've got an equilibrium effect, and we can assign depending on the distance and the temperature an equilibrium enrichment or fractionation factor to that. Super easy, all right, we're living in an equilibrium world. No, we're not, all right? Now we get the real world. During evaporation, we get incomplete processes that take place because our atmosphere is not saturated, and particularly here in Utah, all right? We're moving now that water, that precip that we created into a vapor that's in a non-saturating atmosphere. And when we see that, generally, we get an evaporation line that becomes shallower than a slope of eight. All right? I'm not going to tell you why yet. Just trust me. But our evaporation line generally is such that if we take that precip and we evaporate it into a non-saturated atmosphere, the vapor that we form from the precip moves in this direction. Again, it's still isotopically lighter, just like it was when we had an equilibrium case, but it's not on the line, right? It's off the line. It's still negative. And of course, we have to adhere to the rules of thermodynamics, right? 
The laws of thermodynamics say that if we want to preserve mass balance, if the vapor is lighter, the residual precip that's left behind has to be heavier. You just took light isotopes away, right? We're not creating matter or destroying it here. We're not creating new thermodynamics. Albert would be really mad at us. So we have to preserve mass balance. So that means our vapor goes this direction. The residual water that's left behind gets more positive. But they both fall off the line because they're going into a, a desiccating atmosphere, not a saturated atmosphere. So they can't fall on that line that, with the slope of 8. We're going to talk about why it falls the way it does here in a second. So be patient. Now, we're evaporating that water into an atmosphere that also has some background vapor and some isotope value of its own. The vapor coming out of my mouth is mixing with something else that's already out here, right? And so, again, we get fractionation, but we also get mixing, right? We take the vapor from the precip and we mix that vapor that's already floating around in the room here, and that vapor is my orange dot here. Now, vapor created from the precip mixes with vapor that's actually already in the room. All right, now let's do the last step. Let's cool it down and cause precipitation. Did you see that animation? Let's go back. No, back. Orange dot. That's the room. That's the vapor formed from the precip. We mix those two together. We condense it. If we condense it, the liquid phase is going to be heavier than the vapor that it comes from. The heavy isotopes fall out. So watch this line here. We condense it out. We follow that slope of 8. And look where it intercepts. Right? Not at 0. It intercepts somewhere in a positive direction on our hydrogen isotope axis. That's how we get a DXS or an intercept of 10 for the global meteoric water line. We've added a kinetic isotope effect by mixing into a non-saturated atmosphere and then precipitating that out. And we draw, we go on to a new line and our intercept, that regression that we draw through there, intercepts at something that's positive hip here. And that positive number for all the precip on the planet happens to be an intercept of around plus 10. That's for all the precip on the planet, all of it. All right? That's going to vary locally, but for the whole globe, it's about plus 10. That's where that number actually comes from. So it's the additional kinetic isotope effect caused by fractionation during equilibrium processing, mixing into a background atmosphere, and then condensing back out and arriving at a different line, all right, with an intercept that's not zero, but it's positive. That's what explains that number, that D, which we call the DXS, all right, and that DXS will vary on the planet here, all right. Now, the last two bit here is that why does the slope get shallower and why do we fall off the meteoric water line kind of on the oxygen side when we have these evaporation vents with these residual waters that are out here? They kind of always fall over here on this side of the meteoric water line. The vapor disappears, but the residual liquid, they all kind of sit out here. So when we get an evaporation event, all the water seems to go off on the oxygen side, right? And it comes back to the masses, all right? There's a greater mass difference for the, for the common isotopolog of water for, for hydrogen than it is for oxygen, all right? 5.4% difference versus a 2.7% difference between these different isotopes of logs of water. And consequently, with the greater mass and the greater mass difference, you get it manifest on the oxygen side more than you do on the hydrogen side. All right? 
You've got to work through that a little bit. Just look at the mass differences and work, out, work it out a little bit. You're going to see that those mass differences are larger right? for the bigger mass isotopes, the oxygen. The other thing is part of this is an optical illusion. Remember, the hydrogen scale is eight times larger than the oxygen scale. So they're not exactly the same. We're not moving in a proportional world here. And so consequently, some of this, that we're seeing it affecting both isotopes. But it looks, more, it looks stronger also, looks stronger to us, because the scale for hydrogen is eight times larger than the scale for, for oxygen. So there's kind of two things at play there, a mass effect and a different in differences in how the diffusion of the water works. But also, you're looking at two different scales. And that's why it manifests the way it does. We're going to have coffee here in one second. The one thing I just want you to take away from this is that whenever then you're dealing with waters out there in the environment that have been affected by evaporation, kinetic isotope effects beyond the additional equilibrium effects of phase changes, they always fall off the line and the slope becomes less than 8. So evaporated waters tend to be in a lower slope world and fall off over here on this side of the meteoric water line. And you can do the experiment for yourself. Take a soil, evaporate it, all right? Measure it at time one, time two, time three. That each one of those samples will go like this. You'll start with the water that you put on the soil. You'll evaporate it. The next one will be there. The next one will be there. The next one will be there. The, the residual water that stays in the soil just gets heavier and heavier, and it falls off more and more on the oxygen side. You can prove it to yourself. It's really cool. And of course, the, the change of the slope here is going to be a function of what the humidity is of the atmosphere that you're actually evaporating that water into. That slope will become shallower and shallower and shallower as you evaporate that water into a more and more desiccating world. All right. We're going to look at that after we take a coffee break. But it's really so that the changes in the slope, you're getting evaporated waters, but the changes in the slope will depend on what the desiccating atmosphere actually looks like. Is it, is it, is it 80 percent? Is it at 5 percent? So the, so the slope itself will really be a manifestation of what the atmosphere is that you're evaporating water actually into. All right. Let's have coffee. is going to differ significantly from what the global line looks like. And if you want a really good benchmark or a reference place to come back to to interpret what, your, what the isotope variation of your water might actually mean, then you want to build that local line. And here's some examples. These actually come out of from river, river water samples, but they're going to make my point is if you look at local meteoric water lines, you can see that they differ quite significantly from the global line. If we look at a, a coastal site, so Western Oregon and Washington, there's our slope of 8 and our intercept of about 12. Well, that's not too far away. That's not bad. But that's a coastal region that's getting much of its precipitation right off the ocean. Remember that ocean water, is, that's, gonna, that's defining lo largely what our global meteoric water line looks like. So we can expect that coastal regions are going to be more similar to what the global meteoric water line looks like compared to other regions. If you look at those compared to these other three ellipses that I've drawn up here for the Dakotas, for Montana, for Minnesota, the slopes are all shallower than eight. So again, now we've gone to something where we've gone to a shallower slope. 
And the intercepts vary dramatically. And look at Montana. Not only does it have a shallow slope, slope of 5, it's got an intercept that's negative, 46. So its d excess is a negative d excess. And so not only does the shallow slope tell you that you've gone into a drier place, but as you'll see here in a few minutes, that negative intercept is implying other things at play. And in the case of Montana, those other things that are at play is its continental location. It's near the continental interior. It's n not anywhere near the coast. So its precip has gone a long way before it's gone to Montana. And it's also a really cold place. And you'll see in a few minutes here, when we go to colder environments, we tend to get more negative isotope ratios in the precipitation that falls into those sites there. So that's manifest quite nicely in the, the DXS or the intercept number for the Montana local meteoric waterline. So I just want to make sure that I make the point here that if you move around and you're working on water sourcing, and you're working on the organisms, or maybe what the trees are taking up, or your insects, your birds, whatever it happens to be, many times you're going to want to start right away to build your local meteoric waterline, because otherwise your interpretation of your isotope data becomes really challenging, because you don't have a local benchmark. You're comparing everything back to the global, and the global is just too, it's too far away from what's going to inform your, your local samples. Their last bit of Juno, which is like a cold weather green plus versus Vera, which is tundra, and I think it wouldn't use the same number. Bingo. No, you and you just said the reason why. So if you're working in Barrow, you definitely want to be probably your put your precip collectors out near Barrow and start collecting all your your samples right there if that's where your the study site is because as you just said you know Barrow is internal it's higher elevation Juno is of course right on the coast and so you could expect that those local meteoric water lines are going to differ really significantly from each other and you'd really if you're working in Barrow collect your samples in Barrow that's real that's the best advice I can actually uh, provide you all right other questions there if you're working near the Great Lakes for example then you're getting a mixture of the ocean and the you could, and in, yeah, and in fact, uh, Gabe Bowen, who I think you guys will probably meet, he's, he's part of the other spatial course. He's actually done some work where he's looked at how the lake affects, you know, how the water that actually comes off of the Great Lakes area gets injected, the vapor that comes off those lakes, gets injected into the air masses of air that are moving out of Canada, and how that can have a unique fingerprint or isotope value associated with the precip then that falls on, on the lee side, the lake effect so snows that we see in many of the great lake areas can't really be explained by the origin of the storm. It's the origin plus the injection off the lake that actually explains what those values are. So there can be some mixing, particularly in large lakes like the Great Lakes. So it's really important. It's a very, very really good point. Okay, other questions? Why not? Okay, no more questions. Let's move on. Okay, so.